This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. Hi, this is Greg LeBlanc. Welcome to Unsiloed. And I'm here today with uh, George Cooper, who is the uh, founding partner at Equitile uh, and chief investment officer at Equitile, and also the author of a couple books that we're going to discuss today, uh, the most recent of which is this one, um, Fixing Economics, uh, the story of how the dismal science was broken and how it can be rebuilt, which I think is kind of a, uh, it's a broadside. It's just sort of a, you know, missile launched into the uh, economics profession. I think someone described you as another one of those, uh, what, technical folks that's attacking the profession. I think uh, you, you you quoted someone as, as describing you that way. Uh, and this is actually a revised version of, of this book here, Money, uh, Blood, and Revolution, which some of you might have. It's still sort of the older version I didn't. I didn't know at first that that was the revised version. I went up. I got both now. So there we go. I'm a collector. <laughs> and then, of course, uh, George's older book, um, which came out after the financial crisis, called uh, "The Origin of of Financial Crises." Um, and uh, so we'll, we'll discuss both of these books. Um, and I, I guess I wanted to just start off by by asking the the question, uh, which is. Um, you know, do you think that the economics profession, as as we now know it, has a future, um, or do you think that it is indeed kind of like the pre-Copernicus uh, view of the world, the Ptolemaic curly Q model of the world? Is there anything that we can salvage from uh, neoclassical um, economics and its offshoots? Funnily enough, I'm actually uh, I'm a rare critic of economics in that. I think it's got a, a very bright future. Um, I mean, if we go back to um, you know the Ptolemaic view of uh, of the universe, it it was wrong, but it did eventually lead to a much better uh, understanding of the universe, a scientific breakthrough, and, and that's really what I talk about in, um, in in fixing economics. The you can get a situation in sciences where the, the paradigm, the, the world view, is is completely wrong, um, and leads you down some, you know, pretty confused dark alleys. But I think there is the there is the germ of the new paradigm already out there. I think there are. So I, I'm an optimist about economics in that I think uh, I think it can transform itself into something approaching, you know, what I rather cheekily call a real science, which I don't think it's there at the moment. And you've got to remember, you know, if we go, we would view medicine now, which I think is a fairly good analogy. We would view medicine as being a pretty scientific field. Um, but if we go back sort of a few hundred years when we were putting leeches and on people and uh, bloodletting and, and things like that. It was really not very scientific. Uh, so I think economics can have a similar transformation, but we shouldn't expect it to be a mathematical science in the way that physics is. I think we, it's, a, it's, got, it's always going to be a blend, I think, of um, different approaches, some mathematical, some non-mathematical, just like medicine is, for example. Well, I mean, I think a lot of economists would push back and they would say that they think economics really is, you know, very scientific and uh, it's been used to design markets, it's been used to design firms, it's been used to design incentive schemes and, and solutions. Um, and I think in, in your book, you kind of contrast the areas where economics seems to be doing a fairly good job and, and those areas where it's not. In particular, I think you draw the distinction between uh, kind of the, the goods and services market and the uh, kind of the asset markets uh, is are, are these yeah. are these areas that uh, you know are deserving of, of very different treatments um, why is it that the insights that we've developed around goods and services I think it was Samuelson who said that you know since it does such a good job with goods and services we can just sort of map over our insights into into the asset markets is that is that a fundamental yeah. mistake that economics makes i think that is a fundamental mistake um and that, and that's sort of the uh, 
that's the core of the problems that I discuss in in the um, origin of financial crises. You know, I'm a I'm a professional investor, uh, and like pretty much every every other professional investor, I'm seeking out assets that have limited supply. So I'm willing to pay more money for an asset that's got some sort of supply constraint around it. So I would bid up I would bid up the price of an asset if it can't uh, have its supply increased. If you think about goods and services, when you get increased demand, you get increased supply. New factories can be built. And that equilibrates the, the supply demand dynamic. But in asset markets, it works in a different way. And the other thing with the asset market is you don't buy it to use it as an asset, you buy it to eventually sell it. And you also generally, at the aggregate level, if we look at the, the whole economy, we tend to buy assets financed with debt. And the creation of debt is supported by collateral and the collateral is the assets. And then when we put in another little detail on that, that we reprice all of the assets at the margin, you know, this is an idea that economists are very, um, are very proud of, but I don't think they've really thought it through to what that means for the asset markets. You know, today, the biggest share in Microsoft, the biggest uh, company by market cap is Apple. Uh, if I go out and buy one share of, of Apple and I pay an extra 1% higher than the market, I can reprice a, a nearly $2 trillion company with just a few dollars of, of market activity. So I could create you know, millions and millions of dollars of market value, at least on paper, and that creates a whole lot of extra collateral for the banks to lend against, which allows people to borrow more money to buy more shares in Apple, which pushes the share price of Apple up. And this is a, when you, th when you think through this effect, you realize it's a, it's a classic, what's, what engineers call positive feedback system. And, and this is why I think the asset markets are fundamentally unstable. Why, <clears throat> why we get these boom bust cycles, whereas the goods markets are fundamentally stable. Because if you get the extra demand, you get the higher price, you either get new, new sources of manufacture coming in or you get substitution of goods, but you don't get those effects in, in the asset markets. Well, well, part of the feedback is that it does lead to the creation of more financial instruments, right? So if, if, you know, if the price of subprime mortgages goes up, then everybody says, hey, we got to go start making some more, you know, subprime mortgages, right? Uh, isn't that sort of the, an essential part of the whole, you know, feedback mechanism that you're describing? Well, well yeah, I mean, but this is, if you, if you think about what's underlying those subprime mortgages, I mean, I, I the... The first book, The Origin of Financial Crisis, I actually wrote that in the, in the period of the U.S. housing bubble, just before the global financial crisis. And, and I wrote it because uh, at the time I, I was working as, uh, as a fixed income strategist for Deutsche Bank. And I started discussing the ideas of Hyman Minsky, which is what the the book is largely based on. I started discussing his ideas with some of our clients, um, and I found to my surprise that very few people knew of his ideas. Mm -hmm. So I started writing some research papers, um, talking about his ideas, and then eventually turned that in, into a book. But the, the point of that is, um, in that period, there was a huge demand for subprime mortgages uh, and the banks then uh, uh, actually went out and 
acquired the mortgage originators so they could drive the mortgage origination even more because there was such a demand for the, the paper, for the bonds. Mm -hmm. But that, of course, ultimately meant it was driving credit into the housing market, which inflated the house prices, which made the previous, uh, the, the mortgages that had been issued in previous years seem even higher quality than, than they'd expected because the collateral had, had risen. So you got this positive feedback loop. Um, you know, I remember I was, I guess I was part of it in a sense, but I watched, I watched that mortgage bubble inflate and you could see the, you could see these positive feedback loops happening in real time, mm -hmm. but this is not, uh, it's not embedded in mainstream economic theory, which has this idea of a sort of general equilibrium model, mm -hmm. this idea that if you leave the uh, if you leave the economy alone, it will self-regulate. No, no, that, that's sort of not what I saw. In fact, while we're on that topic, the the original idea came to me when when I started to I sort of I joined uh, the sort of economics uh, thinking, if you like, late in relatively late, I, I wasn't a trained economist, but when I came into analyzing the financial markets, one of the things that struck me as strange was that we had a central bank regulating the credit markets, regulating the bond markets, um, but we didn't have a central bank regulating other markets. You know, there's nobody regulating the price of a can of beans, at least maybe they, they did in the 70s, but they do regulate the price of bonds with their interest rate policy. So if you follow economic theory, which is the, this idea of general equilibrium, you've got to ask yourself, why do we need a central bank? And when you ask that question, you, it's like sort of pulling on a thread and and the the fabric unwinds quite quickly when you ask that question because mm -hmm. you go to a textbook you won't find any any textbook that really explains why we have a central bank well and you mem you mentioned Hyman Minsky and and I think you're right Hyman Minsky is someone who is uh, pretty um underappreciated under discussed uh and he uh is famous for the financial instability hypothesis. And I think his claim is that it's stability that creates instability. He's really uh, a proponent of this feedback view. Um, is that really the key weakness in what you call kind of the neoclassical economics as applied to the financial markets? The idea that there is this tendency towards self-regulation, tendency towards e equilibration, uh, a, a kind of a, a negative feedback loop, uh, similar to the one that we see in, in, in goods markets? Um, I, I think that's the essence of it. Yeah, I, I do think it's the essence of, of, of it. Um, and I think that comes, it comes from you know, recognizing the role of the credit creation system. I think there's, there's a line in the book where I, I say something along the lines of, you know, when you understand the the connection between asset inflation, profit formation, and credit creation, when you realize that all three of those are intimately entwined, then you you can no longer believe in an equilibrium model anymore. Mm -hmm. Because the asset inflation leads to the credit creation and Interestingly, the creation of credit also leads to, tends to lead to a boom in corporate profits. So the more, this is where I, um, I say there's a, there's a mirror uh, of uh, Keynes's idea of a paradox of thrift. So Keynes, Keynes explained the Great Depression by saying that 
if you get um, if you get a tendency for the whole economy to try to save at once, so you, you get a negative shock and people become more cautious, so they try to save more money. That means they spend less money. So that means the incomes of other people go down. So they then start to try to save more money because they're earning less money. And you have this negative spiral, which he called the paradox of thrift. Um, I hunted around for the right way to express the mirror of that. And I came up eventually with the, the phrase of paradox of gluttony. I'm not sure it's the best phrase, but it was the best one I could come up with. And that's the, the idea that the more we consume, the more we spend, um, the more people's income goes up. So the more it appears that we were right to spend more money. So you get a, a boom cycle. So, and, and I think I, I kind of see Minsky as really just completing Keynes's analysis. Keynes had one half of that cycle. And Minsky said sort of, hey, wait a minute, there is a paradox of uh, thrift, but there is also a paradox of gluttony. Uh, that, that was my phrase rather than his phrase, but nonetheless, that's basically what he said. So you get this this symmetric boom bust. But you know, when you look at uh, Keynes, uh, Keynes has, I mean, Keynes emphasizes a couple different points. I mean, I think the one that people tend to focus on is the idea of animal spirits, and so an entire discipline has emerged, which we call behavioral finance which emphasizes kind of the the non-optimizing nature of of participants in these financial markets and i think you you know you talk about uh you talk about the behavioral um assumptions in your other book um mm -hmm. but but you know even in a world where we don't have to think about animal spirits where everyone is a, is a totally rational actor even if we accept the 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 optimization model of individual behavior you know i think the the, the paradox of thrift is really uh, something more to do with kind of the composition fallacy. And I think you, you highlighted this in, in your, in your, in your book where you talk about the, um, you know, the millennium bridge uh, and, uh, and other examples where um, what makes sense at the individual level doesn't make sense at the, at the aggregate level. So for instance, you know, yeah. marking to market and, uh, and, uh, and, you know, rebalancing and recollateralizing all make makes sense at the individual level, but uh, in the aggregate level, it leads to uh, leads to profound negative consequences. Is, is that is that? I mean, do you think that the behavioral finance folks, the way you understand them, are really kind of going down the wrong path because they're they're focusing too much on on the individual and they're they're ignoring the 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 system wide um, uh, uh, dynamics. Uh, well, I wouldn't say they're going down the wrong path. I think there's there's a very valid um, area of research. And actually, I think the behavioral finance um, analysis of, of individual behavior is is actually pretty well advanced and, uh, and very useful. But I think it's incomplete because we haven't we haven't extended it to this next level where there is a a fallacy of composition in terms of how the group behaves. And again, I think this is, this is a huge problem with economic theory because uh, economists tend to try to condense the, the economy down to a, a single rational agent and say you can basically model the whole economy as though it was just one representative consumer and one representative producer and i i think you you can't do that i i think we have effectively we have herding in in the economy I mean, if we were all absolutely rational you wouldn't have fashions and you wouldn't have you know trends of of public opinion you, you wouldn't have an, a, a you know advertising agencies wouldn't be viable so the, you can see all sorts of symptoms of herding behavior in the economy. Booms and busts are one of them, but you can see them you know, all over. Uh, and, and that's just not accounted for and not really allowed for. So I think that's, that's another side that's, uh, that's missing. But even that is probably not the biggest part that's missing. I would say 
the and this is coming more into into the second book, but we analyze we tend to analyze the economy only from the private sector side. But there are no, I'm going to be, you know, I, I think we can be pretty definitive here and say there are no successful economies in the world that are 100% private sector. Every successful economy in the world has got a public sector that is of comparable size to the private sector. So where we tend to, when we're looking at an economy, we tend to look at just the, the goods and services side to develop the theory. And then we assume that we can, the theories we develop in the private sector goods and services, we can apply to the private sector capital markets, which I don't think we can. Um, and then we assume we don't need to worry too much about the public sector at all. Um, and so I would say, you know, if we, if we split the, if, if we agree that, say for argument's sake, half the economy is private sector and half is state sector, and then we say, well, half of the private sector is goods and services and half of it is capital markets, then really we're, we're only analyzing a quarter of the economy. And, and that's part of where the problems come in as well. Well, in, in that second book, you, you have sort of a taxonomy of, of these different schools of, of economics. And, and I think mm -hmm. the, uh, I mean, if, as an economist, I, I would probably, if I were going to do a taxonomy of schools of economics, that wouldn't look anything like your taxonomy. But I think mm -hmm. the taxonomy you've come up with makes sense from the perspective that you're approaching it, which really is about um, uh, policies towards uh, markets, uh, intervention in markets, relationship between public and private, in particular, uh, you're very interested in, in monetary policy. So, so you you know you talk about the you know classical economists, talk about Austrian economists, you talk about you know monetarists mm -hmm. and Keynesians, behavioral and institutional, and so forth. Um, and then you have you set up a um, kind of a, a two by two framework classic business mm -hmm. school two by two framework, which has to do yeah. with, yeah. uh, you know, approaches to, to, or faith in the stability of, of markets and the, uh, degree of government intervention that you, you think, uh, that they think ought to uh, take place in those, in, in those markets. Um, I just want to, where did this taxonomy come from? How did you start thinking through, uh, you, you know, did you just start reading all of these these uh, economists and and, uh, and and try to make sense of it? Uh, it's always interesting to me when someone comes from outside of the economics profession and is trying to make sense of it. You know, and they see they see it differently than the people who are in the trenches. Yeah. Um, okay. So I, I, if I go sort of back through the journey I went on, um, but part part of my my day job, if you like, was um, was a central bank watcher, a Fed watcher, and Bank of England and ECB watcher, and that's when I I started to try to learn the economic theory behind why we had these institutions managing monetary policy, and I did a lot of reading around the subject to to try to find that theory, and basically the only theory I could find that made any sense to me was Minsky's theory. Mm -hmm. it, so that led me to, to realize that there was this guy sort of sitting out on the fringes, um, which seemed to make sense to me. Uh, but then when I started discussing uh, Minsky's idea with some of the economists at the bank, and we had some you know, very, very good, very experienced economists at the bank, um, and with uh, many of the, the clients that I had at the time who were also, a lot of them were very well-trained economists. What I found was there was some that had never heard of Minsky, um, but some that had heard of him and had quite a visceral dislike of his ideas mm -hmm. because they clashed so much with, with their own thinking. Uh, so that's, that's sort of... Um, piqued my interest. And then I started you know, reading 
about mainstream versus Minsky, and then the Austrian school. And I could see that the Austrian school had actually essentially the same analysis as Minsky and Keynes, and the Austrians would hate to, to hear that. But I think basically Keynes's analysis and Hyman Minsky's uh, analysis is essentially the same as, as the Austrians. But the difference is their recommended solution or their recommended policies that go with that analysis. So the, both, the, both the Austrians uh, and uh, Hyman Minsky and Keynes say that the economy is fundamentally unstable. But one group say it's unstable, leave it alone. And the other group say it's unstable, you need a lot of policies to manage it. You know, Keynes with his fiscal policy and, and Minsky with both fiscal and, and monetary. Uh, so that was that became interesting to me. And then of course you've got Marxists and um, you know a few other groups and, and even since I've written the book we've now got modern monetary theorists. You know, the monetary the monetary side of economics is one that keeps inventing a new school of thought every few years. And modern modern monetary theory is the latest incarnation uh, of it. So uh, what happened was I had all of these different schools with different ideas and I was just trying to make sense of them to myself. So I, because I was at this point, I was giving quite a lot of talks about the first book, uh, the, the Origin of Financial Crisis book, because that, that came out just before Lehman Brothers failed. So there was naturally a lot of interest in people hearing about what caused financial crises. So I ended up giving a lot of talks. And there was one particular lecture where I, I was giving a talk at Imperial College in London uh, about the financial crisis. And I put up on the board the, the chart that's, that's in the Fixing the Economics book with the different schools of economics. And I just started talking through you know, the, the different um, schools of thought and how, where I, I thought there was a clash between them and where there were agreements. And at the end of that talk, one of the professors from Imperial College um, came up to me and he said, what you've just set out there is very much in accordance with uh, the ideas of Thomas Kuhn. He said, you should go and read uh, the structure of scientific revolutions. Now, I'd heard of the book and, and I might have even read parts of it years, years prior to it, but it certainly wasn't current in my mind. But anyway, eventually I did go away and read it. And I realized that Kuhn was actually giving a pretty precise description of at least how I viewed economics uh, through his analysis of basically how science is stored. Uh, and I thought what was even more interesting was, and I think this is where Kuhn is, I mean, he's, he's highly rated, but I think he's actually vastly underrated because I think what his book sets out is not just an explanation of how and why sciences go, to, go wrong, but he actually sets out a roadmap as to how to fix sciences when they've gone wrong, how to get out of the, the sort of thinking traps um, so I just followed his template and said, well, okay, let's, let's, let's do with the second book, essentially what I did with the, the first book was effectively trying to take Minsky's ideas and explain them to the layman. Uh, and the second book was just take Thomas Kuhn's ideas and explain them to the layman about economics and say, well, if we follow his roadmap, how do we need to rethink economics to, to get it to progress? So that's sort of how I came to, to, to do it, to write the book. Yeah, I mean, it's, it seems awfully bizarre that... Sorry, you, you yeah. dropped out there, Gregory. I got as far as awfully sure. bizarre. But 
and I lost yeah. you. It seems awfully bizarre if you went to a doctor and 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 uh, you went to five different doctors and you got five different diagnoses and five different treatment plans. I think you'd start to question the the uh, the the merits of medicine as as a science, right? Yeah, yeah, and and I think that's that's the problem. You can you can go to different schools of economics and you can get. You can get all sorts of different answers. Um, you know, if you want the answer, hey, we need fiscal austerity, you can get an economist to tell you that. If you want an, the answer that we need much higher corporate taxation, you'll find an economist that tell you that. But if you want the opposite answers, you'll find economists that'll tell you those as well. And that's that's not a mark of a science. Yeah. You know, if you go to well, if you go to an engineer and say how do I build a plane, you'll you'll get pretty much one answer. Right now, if it was just a question of differences in preferences or, or politics, I think it would be easier to understand. But I think the, these are actually economists who all of whom agree on on what the objective is, and uh, all of whom uh, are 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 doing what they think is is a scientific approach to uh, the problem, but their, their ways of thinking are incommensurate in so many ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I think there's also, um, there's another idea that I think is important and it's related to, um, it's related to Kuhn's uh, ideas. Um, so one of the, one of the great things I think that Kuhn said was, when you've got a, a scientific field or a, a field that's trying to be scientific, but it has the wrong base model, the wrong paradigm for how the world works, if you like, then it fractures into lots of different confused and conflicting, literally warring factions, just as you know the, the Marxists and the Austrians would consider themselves to be you know, diametrically opposed. They are in conflict. But what um, what Kuhn explained was, in in that situation, there's often important truths and and valid insights in all of these different groups. And in order to get, uh, in order to move the field forward, you've got to find a new story that allows you to intellectually accept the good bits from all of the different schools. And if you can get that, if you can get that leap, literally a new story in your head that lets you say, okay, then the Marxists are right on this, but the capitalists are right on this, the libertarians are right on this, um, then if you can get one that cherry picks the good bits from each school and gets them to work cooperatively, then you've got a, a leap forward. Mm -hmm. Now, as I, I guess I, I looked at Kuhn's analysis, I looked at economics, and then I looked sort of back at my own training as a, as a physicist, a uh, physicist and an engineer. And one of the things that occurred to me was that if you look at pretty much all of the big scientific breakthroughs, they, they resolve this clash between ideas by moving from a static equilibrium model to a dynamic model. So, yeah, if you think about... Um, uh, for example, Darwin's evolution of species. The prior model before Darwin was species were immutable, they never changed, they were created at the start of the Earth, and Darwin went to a dynamic model. No, they're always changing, they're constantly evolving. The same thing with Alfred Wegner when he uh, discovered continental drift. 
The previous model was a static model. The Earth was solid. He resolved the, the mysteries of why the continents appear to fit together by going to a dynamic model. Uh, William Harvey, these are the, the, the ones that I discuss in the book. William Harvey, when he's explaining how um, the body worked, uh, he, he allowed medicine to, to make its breakthrough by recognizing that there was a circulatory flow of blood. So it went from a sort of static blood seeping out of the, I think it was the liver, was the original model. Uh, and he went, in, he went to a circulatory model of the blood being pumped by the heart. You, you see it in other, there's other examples as well. Um, I think it was Dalton who developed his atomic theory uh, for matter when he recognized that there was a rain cycle. So there's evaporation from the oceans into the clouds and then condensation, rain back to earth. Similarly, physics has had this for hundreds of years had this clash between is the light a wave or is it a particle? And we sort of fudged the, the answer of that by accepting that it, it's sort of both. Uh, so if you take that sort of template and you say, well, economics, it's got this equilibrium static idea. But then you say, well, Actually, maybe that's not right. Maybe we can get the, the ideas of the different schools to fit together by going to a dynamic model, which is why I talk about this circulatory idea. It is literally uh, copying William Harvey's idea, essentially, and say, well, how can you reconcile? You know, let's go to the extremes. How can you reconcile Adam Smith's worldview with Karl Marx's worldview. It's actually relatively easy, I think. You just, you can accept that people are striving to improve their lot. Adam Smith's model, trying to get richer. That tends to lead to a, uh, in, in a natural capitalist economy, it tends to lead to a polarization of wealth flowing up the social pyramid. Marx, that's essentially Marx's critique of capitalism. And Marx's answer to that was, well, you need progressive taxation, or one answer, progressive taxation to redistribute. If we just step back and, and say, well, actually, what happens in the economy? Actually, that's exactly what happens in the economy. All successful economies have this model of on the, on the one side, the capitalists are trying to get richer than each other. That's what the private sector does. And then the state sector fights that. But it fights it in, I would argue, a, a very constructive way. I, I see the two sides as like a bicep and a tricep. You know, these are antagonistic muscles, but they make a working machine. So if you can get that idea into your head, Suddenly, I find myself as a pretty ardent capitalist. I can agree with Karl Marx. And, and that allows you to sort of change your thinking. You don't have to go, no, he's wrong. This is the right way. You can accept that. And, and that's, um, that, I think, helps address one of the problems I see in economics in that it tends to be uh, there's a lot of very linear thinking in economics. Uh, we, and by that I mean, when, we, when it comes to policy, one unit of a policy is good. It follows that, therefore, two units of the policy must be twice as good. And four units, again, twice as good again. Uh, which is what we're seeing with monetary policy at the moment. One dose of fiscal stimulus is of monetary stimulus is good, therefore let's do even more and, and, and more and more. Um, if you've got this more nuanced view, you, you can accept that actually that's not necessarily the case. 
you can have just like in medicine you know one 100 milligrams of the drug might be good 200 milligrams might be better but a thousand milligrams could be fatal and, and i think that's pretty much true for most macro policies well, i think i think in your uh, you've touched on your circulatory model of uh economics which draws on harvey and, and darwin uh and you've alluded to the what i'll call the cooper curve which is the uh, uh sweet spot when it comes to uh government governmental role in the economy yeah. um but as a central bank watcher maybe we just circle back to the central bank um we had financial crises and before we had central banks and central banks were supposed to come in and kind of mitigate these these crises you know create more stability uh, but I think you would argue that that the central banks have have failed. Uh, I think you'd you'd probably argue that the central banks they don't seem to have a coherent uh, policy. They 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 have a mishmash of 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 policies, uh, and this mishmash has potentially exacerbated some of the 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 instability. Could could you talk a bit about remind what you, your argument actually reminded me? I interviewed Kevin Coldiron who talked. He wrote a book called The Rise of Carry, and and uh, some of your points are, are very similar to to his in that respect. Yeah. Um, okay. So if um, the way I the way I see the role of the central bank is uh, it, essentially it is in engineering terms. It's the, the element that produces the control system feedback loop. So um, it's the thermostat effectively. So if you've got the boiler running your, your, um, your central heating system, if you like, mm -hmm. producing the heat to heat the building, and then you've got a, a temperature sensor that measures the temperature of the building, then you've got a thermostat that's basically there to say, okay, I'm looking at the temperature of the building. It's too cold. Let's turn the heat up. Let's get the boiler to produce more heat. Sends the heat to the building, waits for the temperature to increase, and then says, okay, we've got enough. Let's turn the heat down again. So it's the, it's the control system feedback loop. The... There's actually a big branch of sort of applied mathematics uh, around control system feedback uh, loops and how to control fundamentally unstable systems in order to to make them work in a more stable way. You know, this is a, this is very very established, very uh, you know well known engineering. And I think and I wanted to thank you for. Inter in I want to thank you for introducing me to James Maxwell, who I hadn't uh, known before, and his work. I thought that was that was very very interesting. Well, Maxwell's a fascinating character, um, and, and in fact, a lot of you know Maxwell is famous for all sorts of things. He he uh, uh, he came up with the electromagnetic theory, so he unified um, the theory of magnetism and and electricity. He's actually the guy that first worked out that we see we've got three different color receptors in our eyes. Mm -hmm. So he also worked, you know, effectively worked out how we could make a, a color TV screen, and how we could do color photography. In fact, I think he was the first person ever to project a color photo. So he was a he was a polymath on on in many ways. Um, but his control system theory uh, is a pretty pretty good template for understanding central banks and, and what they're there for. So they're basically, as I see it, the economy is running too slow. In other words, if we've gone into one of these a Keynesian paradox of thrift and we've gone down into a, a recession, then the central bank should be there to literally print the money and, and kickstart the economy. Similarly, if we've gone into a paradox of gluttony, uh, then the central bank should be there to turn the thermometer, turn the thermostat down, take money out of the economy to sort of try to cut off the 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 most extreme parts of the booms and the busts. 
the problem I see it is we we evolved the central banks out of practical necessity. You know, if you look at the history of the Federal Reserve, you look at the history of the Bank of England or the, the, the other central banks, they, they were born out of crises in a way. They were born out of a necessity. They weren't born out of a theoretical, hey, we, we've studied the economy and we think we need one of these. So as a consequence, they're there, they're doing a job, they're doing a necessary job, but they're not, they don't have a good theory behind them. And particularly recently, but actually that's not fair, for, for a long time, we've tended to stuff central banks with very well-trained economists who are very deeply schooled in this general equilibrium theory. So they don't necessarily think in the way uh, that I think you need to think if you are controlling the thermostat, because they're they don't see the, you don't need, they don't you don't, they need don't see the economy as a euro euro fighter jet. No, so their theory says you don't need a central bank. So we've taken we've taken the people that believe you don't need a central bank and put them in charge of the central bank, and that's a recipe for problems. Well, there is a there are a lot of people who are critiquing economics from within and without, and and you in the in the this book um, talk about what you call the rethinking economics movement, right? Or I don't know, it's more of a um, collection of movements, uh, and you immersed yourself in it and tried to go out mm-hmm. and learn about what they were saying. Uh, but you're very critical, uh, and you say this is not this is not this may be a way station, but this is not uh, an alternative, a true alternative to uh, the current state of economics. Uh, could you could you comment on that? Yeah, um, yeah. I'm I'm afraid to say I I think the the rethinking economics movements rather than uh, fixing economics are actually a symptom of more of the same. They're, they're even more fragmentation uh, of the economic landscape into more and more competing uh, schools of thought. Um, I was at a, uh, a round table between a lot of these different think tank groups uh, several years ago because, because I'd written these books, which was critical of economics, and they tend to be critical of economics. I was invited to a few of these meetings and I was even invited to join a few of these groups. Um, But uh, there there was one particular meeting, if I recounted to you. So there was one group there representing, I think it was the organization Positive Money, uh, which has essentially uh, morphed into a, a sort of modern monetary theory school, I believe now. And there was another uh, group representing what I would call um, ecological economics, if you like. So there was one group that's saying, we need to take into account the damage that economic activity does to the environment. And another group saying, we need to try to address inequality in society by printing more money uh, so that we can give give bigger social security checks to the poor and we can pay for more health care and education and keep the economy from going into recession. That was a key part of their argument or their, their desire. And I pointed out at that round table that there was a fundamental clash between their two goals because the printing money school that wanted to maximize economic activity to to help the bottom of society, that meant doing doing more stuff and therefore causing more environmental damage. Uh, and the, the point I, I tried to make in that meeting was, we're not gonna get anywhere unless you recognize that there is a fundamental clash between these two objectives. And, and it will come down to a trade-off. 
you have to, at some level, you have to decide some amount of economic activity is necessary, some amount of, and therefore, some amount of environmental damage will be incurred. And that will cost money to clean up. Uh, similarly, you can't just stimulate the economy because you will do too much damage. So you've got to, you've, You've got to recognize these clashes, but um, I don't see that the, these new rethinking movements are, are being honest with that. I mean, we are, we're seeing a lot of the, the central bankers with this, you know, now, for example, in the, in the COVID crisis or the aftermath of the COVID crisis, coming out with this build back better mantra and the massive fiscal stimulus programs, which are being dressed up as green programs, but they're, they're actually trying to get the economy to recover from what's been a huge recession, but that's not a green agenda. If we really wanted a green agenda, we would be doing less, not more. So mm -hmm. I, Why, I, I think that this there's more confusion. Well, in addition to the big fiscal stimulus, we've we've seen a massive, uh, we've seen QE, I don't know what we're on now, QE5, QE6. There's been just yeah. a, a sequence of these uh, these monetary um, uh, infusions over the last couple decades. Um, do, do you see this as unsustainable fundamentally, um, the, the reaction to the sequential crises with more and more monetary stimulus and more credit expansion um yeah in the in the end it is kind of un, unsustainable i i remember when i wrote when i wrote the origin of financial crisis i sent it to the publisher uh just just after bear stearns had failed bear stearns and northern rock had failed mm -hmm. lehman brothers had not failed yet so this was like March of 2008. Yeah, that, that, that would sound about right. So by the time it actually came out, Lehman Brothers had just failed. So I, I think the, the green book that you've got there, um, if I remember rightly, that book doesn't mention Lehman Brothers because that was the first edition, right. but the second edition does. Um, so By the way, it was after that, it was after that, after the collapse of Lehman Brothers that, that, um, at my school, there was all of a sudden an interest in a course on uh, on, on financial crises and instability, and and you know it, that lasted for a couple of years, and then people lost interest. Well, that uh, great you you you've you've said what I, I was going to say because um, when Lehman Brothers failed, I sort of said to myself, "Well, okay, now it's so obvious." That everything I've said in the book is now suddenly obvious and the book's pointless. Um, and, and that was sort of true for about a year, maybe in academic circles, maybe it lasted two years, but in policymakers, I don't think it even lasted a year. There was a brief period of, hey, what went, you know, what went so badly wrong? Um, but if you look at what we're doing now, it's pretty much exactly the same mistakes uh, as as we did in the run-up to the mortgage uh, crisis, but it's on a dramatically bigger scale. I the global financial crisis now pales into insignificance compared to the fiscal stimulus that we're, th we're throwing into the economy now, um, the fiscal and monetary. So. It's, it is doing uh, what, I, what I describe in that book in that the, the cycles are getting wilder and wilder. They're going bigger and bigger over time. The, the current one, I think, is now the, the debt crisis that's come with COVID is now so big that I think there is no, there is really no conceivable way out of it other than uh, a massive monetization of the debt, right? so a, a devaluation of money. Um, that's I, I I just can't see an al 
an alternative to that at this point. I think that's where we're headed over the next few decades. And the problem with that is it might get us out of the debt crisis, but history shows that that tends to be a pretty disruptive event. I'm using a bit of British understatement when I say disruptive <laughs> event. <laughs> well, and, and I think that you, you suggest that this also is going to have uh, a profound consequence for uh, inequality and that um, although the, the we, we tend to see this as a way of helping the people at the bottom of the pyramid, it may well be um, helping the people at the top uh, far more so. Yeah, this 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 was where, if I go back to um, the discussions with, with some of these uh, new economic thinking groups, um, particularly the Positive Money Group, um, and now even more the MMT, the Modern Monetary Theory groups, this is where I have a uh, quite a strong disagreement with those groups because they tend, uh, they've gone down a line of reasoning which says, let's build an economic theory that justifies essentially an unlimited fiscal deficit. Uh, and they've built that, I think with good intention, but their intention is to create a more equal society. Um, and that, you know, that's a laudable intention, but I think bigger and bigger fiscal deficits actually lead to more and more um, inequality in society. And it, it's actually fairly simple to, to understand why. You just do a thought experiment on what MMT is saying. MMT is saying a gov governments can spend as much money as they like, they can spend far in excess of their tax receipts. So therefore, taxation is in the extreme. If you take their logic to an extreme, you don't need to do taxation. You just print the money that the government needs to spend. Well, if you think about that, all pretty, pretty much all developed economies have a taxation system that is to a greater or lesser degree, redistributive. As in, the wealthy pay more tax than the poor. Maybe not more tax in percentage of their income, but more in absolute numbers. So if you come up with a monetary theory that says actually you don't need to tax at all, then you're probably going to lead to a greater flow of wealth up the social pyramid than you would have otherwise. And I think that's exactly what's happening here. You know, we're seeing, um, yeah, we're seeing a boom in corporate profits coming from the, the the furlough payments. Again, easy to understand why. The furlough payments are there so that people that aren't working during the lockdown can carry on spending in order to keep the corporate sector alive. That's a a massive gift to corporate profits because it takes the wage bill out of the corporate sector but leaves the revenue in the corporate sector. So profits boom. So the owners of the assets get a windfall pay payment. The checks, the checks go to the employees, they go to the workers mm -hmm. and they pass through their bank accounts but the money sits in the in the asset owners bank accounts in the end so it's a it's only a transitory gain so uh, that's why i'm i'm not a big enthusiast for, for mmt i think they they've got some laudable goals but the policies they're recommending are, are going to be counterproductive to their goals i think yeah i like the analogy of the rethinking economics group to a circular uh, firing squad um <laughs> but uh <laughs> But yeah. um, I, I would I would have to I wouldn't want to end without asking you about Brahmagupta because um, that's another person whose ideas you you introduced me to um, and I think I, like Maxwell I'm sure I heard about him at one point but but I didn't realize how you could 
draw insight from Brahma Gupta to understand, you know, the, the modern workings of, of credit. Could you, could you tell us about why, how did you find out about, how did you make the connection between Brahma Gupta and, and uh, the world of credit? Okay. Um, right. Well, so uh, one of the analogies I use to try to explain the credit system and, and why the banking system can effectively create an infinite amount of money uh, is an idea that, that comes from actually theoretical physics, theoretical particle physics. You've probably heard of matter and antimatter. So you can create a, a proton and an antiproton or an electron and an anti-electron, a positron and an electron. Um, you can create them out of nothing. These are two particles, as real as we can define anything being, um, and they are created literally out of nothing. And when you recombine them, they recombine to nothing, apart from energy. You need a lot of energy to create them, and when they recombine, they emit energy. So you've got this idea of, it's a very mathematical idea, a positive number and its equivalent negative number recombined to produce zero, which was essentially Brahm Gupta's insight. Um, and this is what, uh, so the, the particle accelerators literally do this. They create matter and antimatter with the help of a lot of energy. The banking system does the same when it creates money. It creates money and anti-money. So we could, we could agree a contract between ourselves. We could act as effectively a, a mini banking system. You could lend me $1,000. I've then got $1,000 of money. You hold an asset, which is your claim on this money from me. So you've got a debt and I've got an asset. If I repay the money, back to you, the debt vanishes and the money and the debt collapse back to zero. Same thing happens, well, that, that is the banking system. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and this is how, when we talk about money creation, my, my point is we, we need to also think about anti-money creation, which is the debt. So debt and money uh, combined are, are literally created and destroyed. This is why I'm, I'm not a big fan of the money flow theory. Economists like to talk about the velocity of money flowing around the economy. There's some useful, you can get some useful insights from that, but it's really not a fluid. It's actually at all times it's being created and destroyed rather than flowing in a, in a sort of linear manner. Mm -hmm. um, but the Brahm, Brahm Gupta, um, idea is is fascinating because he came up with the concept of zero and negative numbers actually from the credit side because he called his positive numbers fortunes and his negative numbers debts and when you get a in his language when you got a a negative debt matched with a the same size positive fortune, they combine to produce no wealth, zero. So he actually literally invented modern mathematics with an understanding of the credit creation system. Um, so I think we, we, we need to go right back to his original insight and put that into economics. Fascinating. I think he needs to, we know about Luca Pacioli. We need to, you know, study Brahmagupta. Um, so like you have a background in, in physics and, and you're bringing that to economics. And usually when you, when you start with that background, I mean, one of the critiques of economics that you make is that it is kind of has physics envy and it needs to be more like a complex system it has to be more biological in some ways. But you you came to that conclusion with with a background uh, that is more physics in, in its orientation, which I find fascinating. So mm -hmm. do you do you think that economics needs more uh, 
uh, outsider perspectives, people coming in with backgrounds in other disciplines like physics, like biology, like engineering, that can see some of the weaknesses and, and maybe even f historians of science and, and philosophers of science. Yeah, I think it would be, I think that would be a much healthier way of looking at things uh, to get those other ideas in. Uh, funnily enough, although I'm, I'm a physicist uh, by training, I, I actually, I, as you say, I've come to the conclusion that the right analogy is a, is a biological system, not a physical system. And, and I would say probably too many of the crit critics of economics are trying to apply physics rules. I, and this is where I think it's, I think they make mistakes like, um, you know, for, for example, the theory of money flow that's taken directly from physics. That's, that's, you know, you learn that in your first, in your first year of, of physics, it's incompressible fluid flow. And, and that's basically what economists tried to take. Um, a Brownian motion for asset pricing. Yeah, a Brownian motion for asset pricing. Um, actually, I had a I had a lovely experience after I wrote the uh, the first book because I I mentioned um, I mentioned in that book uh, Benoit Mandelbrot's work yeah. because Mandelbrot had um, had analysed uh, the behaviour of financial markets, which. Actually, I didn't realize, I knew Mandelbrot from his fractals. Mm -hmm. And I didn't realize that actually the bulk of his work was analyzing financial market behavior and you know, histories of prices. And he had reached a conclusion that there, were, there was memory, there was evidence of memory in the behavior of financial markets. And of course, that's pretty much exactly what uh, Hyman Minsky's work says, because you get these cycles of asset inflation allowing more credit to be created. So the effectively the balance sheet of the banks and the investors is the memory element that mm -hmm. allows uh, the financial markets to have, to show uh, persistence. Uh, so I wrote about, um, I wrote about that connection uh, in the book and as a result of that, I was actually asked on, onto a, um, a panel uh, to discuss that and a few other things with Mandelbrot himself. And we, we discussed his ideas and, um, and had a few conversations subsequent to that. And he said, you know, it's funny, friends of mine have been telling me to read Minsky for years and I never got round to it because they've been telling me that my ideas were connected to his. Um, so we, we actually arranged to meet up, but sadly he passed away before that, before we met. So, but it was a nice, uh, nice sort of anecdote. Like. Well, George, this has been great. And I, I'm glad that, that you, uh, you know, you represent some inter interdisciplinary thinking and, and silo busting, uh, around economics. And so I'd just like to recommend, I don't know if this one is still, I don't know whether this is like UK versus US or whatever, but you might want to check out uh, Fixing Economics. We only really scratched the surface of it. We really didn't dig into your, your theory as, as much as well as we should have. Uh, and also the origin of financial crises, which really does do a great job of, of, um, of summarizing Minsky, uh, but also um, you know walking through financial crises. So Thanks so much. Uh, let's hope to see you sometime in the Bay Area uh, in person when things get back. I, I would love to. Maybe, maybe when we're allowed to fly again, I might come over. Great to right. talk to you, Greg. This is Unsiloed, brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories.